One is, uh, our suggestion for the, uh, for the third paper. I want to just uh, go through this very briefly. For the third paper, I want you to be, uh, we want you to be more critical in terms of your reflection on the Confucian style of moral reasoning. But also, we want to, to exercise your own ethic of responsibility. That is when you uh, critique some aspect of the Confucian tradition, it would be nice for us all if you could also offer, if possible at all, offer some imagined, from your point of view, imagined Confucian response to the critique. We're not saying that you have to come up with that response, but you should try to at least imagine the possibility of the response. Can the Confucian mode of life accommodate the kind of individual freedom of thought and creativity necessary to high achievement in science or in art? You may say flatly no, and then to try to come up with an interpretive account. But it would be also nice for you to try to help us to respond to that criticism with your own imagined Confucian style of moral reasoning that may even be compatible with some of its ideas. Can a single-minded mind, single minded devotion to science or art fit, fit in with the Confucian focus on interpersonal skills and social involvement? Base your discussion on personal experience in these fields or on real-life cases of people in the sciences and, art, and, and arts. Also, be sure to tie your arguments in to the primary text. And the second one is uh, based upon some of the issues raised in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the 1948 account. You may want to, uh, you may want to come up with an argument concerning the compatibility or even incompatibility of Confucian ethics with the human rights discourse. Uh, I just want to remind you, uh, actually a teacher of mine, uh, Professor Wu, W-U, Wu De Yao, who was one of the original drafters uh, of the Declaration of, of uh, Human Rights in 1948. And he later became a prominent uh, Confucian scholar in Singapore. Evaluate one or more of these articles from a Confucian perspective, or evaluate an aspect of the Confucian tradition in light of these articles. Can Confucianism accommodate a theory of rights? If not, is this a fatal flaw? You may want to compare rights consciousness with duty consciousness. Utilize one of the five relationships as a case study to compare Confucian duty consciousness with modern Western rights consciousness? Which do you prefer and why? Is there a Confucian perspective on our growing ecological concern? Analyze the relationship between humankind and nature in Mencius and the Western inscription or other texts you've read this semester. Can we perceive from this analysis a Confucian vision for properly interacting with the environment? Is that vision convinc convincing? Why or why not? To what extent and in what ways does Confucianism rely upon tradition as a source of values? What are the strengths or weaknesses of drawing upon tradition as a source of moral authority? Formulate the feminist critique of Confucian ethics. Is it possible to devise a Confucian response to such a critique with a view to the future? Uh, personally, two or three years ago, I actually organized a major meeting in uh, Honolulu called the Feminist Critique of Tradition with emphasis on the Confucian, Confucian dimension. I met some of the most brilliant feminists and it was extremely educational. In Neo-Confucianism, there is a concerted effort to metaphysically ground human ethics. 
how do such ideas as vital energy, T, and principle, Li, or inner pattern, relate to earlier Confucian ideas of moral reasoning? Can these new Confucian notions enhance our moral understanding? Please provide practical examples to demonstrate their applicability. Now, if you feel unhappy with any of those questions, you may devise and answer your own question, provided you let your TF know and approve no later than April 25th. Uh, any questions concerning the assignment? Terrific. In order to uh, address the issue of sympathy and empathy, which of course is key to our understanding of this Confucian style of moral reasoning, I would like to introduce an idea. The philosophers are really very much interested in this idea, but it's not, still not part of our own uh, mental furniture. That is the idea of correlative thinking. Correlative, as an adjective, actually indicates a reciprocal or complementary relationship, some relationship that is reciprocal and complementary. You can envision a causal, complementary, parallel, or qualitative relationship, a kind of a correspondence between two intrinsically compatible entities. Now, the assumption say, metaphysical assumption or worldview of the Confucians, in fact, all the major Chinese thinkers, is that this type of correlative relationship is intrinsic to the world. In other words, anything in the world, if you look deeply enough, if you analyze it comprehensively, will have a correlative relationship, which is a big claim. But I think, given all kinds of uh, studies in modern cosmology, physics, and even psychology, this is, not, this is no longer simply imagined. You can argue very persuasively that's the case. So the idea, the simultaneous change in value of two, of two things, sometimes even two random, random variables. They are somewhat connected. Normally, in our, in, our, uh, in our language today, we use the word correlative in a very specific case, a specific sense. We say there is a positive correlation, say, between drug and crime. Right? We can say there's a negative correlation between normal, normal vision, or normal vision and age. That's the way we use the term correlation, correlative. Try to broaden that to imagine a situation where randomly choose any two items in the world, have to imagine the possibility of some correlative relationship. Now, this is, of course, is linked to the idea we've uh, studied it before and have had to revisit it. It's continuity of being. In a sense, all modalities of being in the world are continuous, are interconnected. If we look deeply, analyze comprehensively, we we'll always see the possibility of link between the two. This does not necessarily mean that we cannot differentiate different structures. The ability to differentiate is not at all in conflict with this assumption of the continuity of being. Now, the continuity of beings is based upon a different kind of uh, dichotomous thinking, you know, dividing the world into two. One kind of dichotomous dichotomous thinking that is totally alien to this idea of the continuity of being is the, the dichotomies that are, we are very familiar with under the influence of the modern West, not the West in the period of Greece or in medieval Europe, but, but the modern West. The dichotomy between spirit and matter, for example, and the dichotomy between the body and mind. If we believe as many of us must do, that there's a fundamental difference between spirit and matter. If it is spiritual, then it's not material. If it is material, then it's not spiritual. We would not be able to subscribe to the idea of the continuity of being. We would not be able to think like the Confucians naturally do in 
correlative thinking of the kind they want to introduce to us. Then our understanding of their idea of sympathy and empathy will also be extremely limited. However, it's not at all difficult for us to imagine something which is not at all based upon this dichotomy of the spirit and matter on the one hand or body and mind on the other. In other words, if we do not believe in exclusive dichotomies, we do not, do not believe they are spiritual matters, they're totally devoid of any kind of materiality, and there is matter which has no spirituality at all. If we do not believe that's the case, we believe that everything is made of vital energy, is in process, is in transformation, then we become conversation partners to this idea of the continuity of being and by implication, the idea of correlative thinking. The conceptual resources that we want to use in understanding this are very rich already in our repertoire. What are these conceptual resources that we have now? We have binary, meaning dividing everything into two, binary thinking, but not exclusive dichotomies. For example, we think in terms of the inner and outer. We think in terms of the root and branch. We think in terms of the formal and latter, in terms of the temporal sequence. We think in terms of up and down, in terms of the surface and depth, in terms of even substance and function. In fact, we can even imagine, which doesn't require any kind of leap of faith, you know, we can imagine what may be called spirituality of matter. Everything, every material thing is endowed with certain kind of life, certain kind of vital energy, so certain form of spirituality. Let's first look at the uh, area that is most difficult to imagine, the mineral world. How can minerals have any form of spirituality? Well, to the American Indians, turquoise as a mineral has certain kind of mana, has certain kind of spiritual force. You have a ring made of turquoise, then you're in, you in tune with the spiritual world. For the Chinese, especially the Confucians included jade as a mineral, jade is a stone that has tremendous potency, tremendous of uh, vital energy and spiritual force. In fact, all the sacred mountains, that's the reason I use the example for a painter truly to be able to capture the spirit of the mountain rather than simply the form likeness, the formalistic structure of the mountain by like taking the photo, you know, taking the photo of the mountain, but try to capture the spirit of the mountain and the, the painter is enjoying to go into the mountain, to live in the mountain, to drink the water and to communion with the mountain. And through this kind of spiritual communion, the painter will be able to come back in his own studio and recollect his experience and presumably the spirit of the mountain will move him or her to try to come up with a beautiful painting. So it's possible, not just using any kind of imagination, to communion, to enter into some, some kind of communication with the mountain. Certainly that's true with the trees. Uh, in Hawaii, if you've been there, you know all these banyan trees, hundreds of years, these banyan trees with roots sink down you know, from above, and incredible, incredibly beautiful. And to the Hawaiians, these trees are uh, embodiments of some kind of spiritual forces. Now for the Japanese, in the Shinto tradition, for example, the way of the gods or the way of kami, everything is endowed with certain kind of spiritual force with the kami, even political, social, cultural constructions. A university has a kami, a classroom has a kami, I mean, meaning some kind of uh, spiritual presence. And I know that the, uh, this is, again, very uh, compatible with the Confucian mode of thinking. Uh, Native Americans, 
the indigenous peoples have this ritual of adoption. And it's a very elaborate ritual. You go out in the, in the woods, you go out in the mountains, and you pray, and you want nature, some natural forces, to adopt you. And over this ritual, in a period of time, having been adopted by a certain kind of natural force, you, be, you come back totally revitalized, imbued with certain kind of energy. It's not spirit possession. It's not a psycho, uh, psychosomatic situation, which would be described by psychoanalysts as an abnormal situation. It's not. It's a form of uh, ritual, form of spiritual communion with nature. Now, these things can be very easily understood in the Confucian context, that we are in a continuous interchange with the outside world. Continuous interchange. The yin-yang model, also as a dichotomous, uh, dichotomous mode of thinking, is predicated on the belief that there's always conflict between yin and yang, but there's always complementary relationship. We need to find the yin in the yang and the yang in the yin. It is primarily a theory of interchange. It signifies existence in process. You don't have anything that is a discrete entity. Everything moves, so there is a process. Even stone is a configuration of energy. It also there's possibility of movement. Reality as vital energy, and even the cosmos, is a great transformation. It's always in an evolutionary process. So from the yin-yang perspective, it is inconceivable that concrete living things can possess only pure yin without yang or pure yang without yin. The, ma the most uh, masculine man has a substantial measure of yin in his total makeup. Physiologically speaking, mentally speaking, and spiritually speaking. And the most uh, feminine woman has a substantial yang in her total makeup. Again, physiologically, mentally, and spiritually. The yin-yang mode of thinking dictates that we observe the yang in the yin and the yin in the yang, and by implication, of course, the yin in the yang of yin and the yang in the yin of yang. You can think in terms of very nuanced uh, relationships. We need to pay special attention to their mutuality. It is in the nuances that the yin-yang exchange reveals itself. Now we know physiologically the importance, for example, of female ho hormone in men and the male hormone in women. Without these hormones, we cannot be human. Once there's any kind of deficiency, it becomes very serious. So what we have then between yin and yang is therefore complementary despite the difference. The creative tension engendered by the fundamental, fundamentally different thrusts of vital energy provides the wellspring for the great transformation of not just heaven, earth, but also human beings as well. So in this, in this sense, that the continuity of being as a natural statement about what the world is also has tremendous moral significance for us to learn to be human. What, the nat what, the, what nature naturally is, is a model for us to learn to become what we ought to be. If uh, we encounter any blockage, blockage in terms of this flow of energy, we suffer in a visceral sense, in the physical sense. When we encounter blockage or insensitivity at home, or anomy in society, political alienation, and so forth, we suffer not just morally, but also in a visceral sense. The five elements 
of, should be understood as five agents, not five, five processes. It's also organized in terms of uh, constant interchange, and interchange following two interrelated patterns. In the productive, generative cycle, wood, this is the term that the Confucians use, wood benefits fire, fire benefits earth, earth benefits metal, metal benefits water, and water benefits wood. Don't ask me why, why this is the case. If we continue to take, uh, if, if uh, uh, this is in the generative sense, but in the controlling mechanism, which means to overcome, to suppress, to obstruct, there's a different kind of, uh, different kind of correspondence. So both these elements interact with other elements, sometimes in conflict, sometimes in complementarity. And yet they are mutually interacting. Each of the five elements, whether you call it wood or fire or metal, consists of yin and yang. And the yin and yang are integrated in the great ultimate. And the great ultimate is what we call the principle. And the principle can never realize itself without vital energy, cannot realize itself without vital energy. So the vital energy of yin and yang and the five faces give us a, a, a sense of the continuous flow of the world. Now, this particular um, image of the world is predicated on the possibility of sympathetic resonances of all modalities of beings in the world. The, the possibility of sympathetic resonance is because of the coloration. And that coloration, you know, correlative thinking, uh, presupposes the continuity of being. Everything is interconnected. And this is normally considered as the theory of correspondence. There's always an interaction, a possibility of interaction going on in the world between two random elements. But all this is understood, again, this Confucian thinking, in terms of the principle, in terms of a general thesis. The general thesis is that the principle is one, and it's manifest and its manifestations are many. So we can imagine all these different modalities of being are unified in terms of the unity of the principle. And yet that principle, the inner pattern of the universe, can be manifested in a variety of ways, in numerous ways. So the unity of principle and the multiplicity of its manifestations. It is not possible for us to imagine any modality of the vital energy that does not have an inner pattern. Even though we can imagine an inner pattern, which means the principle independent of any kind of modality, a modality of actual things, we can imagine it. But by and large, all principles are embodied in things. Uh, let me introduce one technical concept. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with uh, Platonism. But it's easy to understand, even if you've never heard of a Plato. Right? Now, Plato has made, it, made a, a very important observation, which turned out to be very vital in understanding Western thought. That is, the idea, the idea in Plato's thinking comparable to the Confucian idea of the principle or the pattern. The idea, when it is being realized in concrete things, a chair, the idea of a chair being realized in a concrete chair, the idea of a human being realized in a concrete human being, the idea of dog being realized in a concrete dog, is always distorted and partial. Therefore, the idea can never be fully embodied in anything. 
nothing can fully embody the idea. It is always a distorted, impartial realization of the idea. Now, this used as a reference point. The Confucians, however, argued that every concrete thing is the full embodiment of the idea. Any concrete thing of modality of the vital energy is the full realization of the idea. It's how the idea realizes itself. However, this is now an important jump, that all modality modalities of things. Each thing embodies an inner pattern, which is the principle. And the principle is the same in each and everything, in the ultimate sense of the term. And also, if you put all these things together, everything's together, the principle, we call it the, outer, the great ultimate, the principle that underlies all things is the same. So the principle, either in terms of its totality, reveals itself, or in terms of its specific manifestations in things, turn out to be the same. Now, maybe at this juncture, let me ask you one question. Don't be bashful. How many of you have not yet read or have, yet, have not yet looked at any of the 10 diagrams? Raise your hands. You haven't seen any of the 10 diagrams. You've all? all all of you have read all these diagrams? Great, it's very encouraging. <laughs> How many of you have looked at all the 10 diagrams, at least once, all the 10 diagrams? Raise your hands. I mean, what happened in between? Okay. <laughs> uh, now, let, let me, uh, whether you've read it, read it or not, I think uh, determines how, how I'm going to say it in the next step. Assuming that you've all somehow look at the diagrams. But assuming also that you're not familiar with any of them. Right? OK, this is, this is what I'm going to try. All right. In the last five diagrams of, uh, of Yitri Gear, I should give Now, in the last five diagrams, e e gear, using what I just described, correlative thinking as the background, he tries to give an account of the, the mind, the heart and mind, human nature and feeling, and the cultivation of the mind as essential for learning to be sage, which means the authentic, the most authentic, the most uh, genuine human being. Now, the assumption is this. If human beings have been, human beings are endowed with the finest manifestation of the vital energy in the world, they are the most sentient beings. And their sensitivity is realized in terms of their ability to communicate to the outside world. And that communication is based upon their ability to establish sympathetic resonances with all modalities of beings, with other human beings, with nature, and with the world. This is the reason that human, uh, part of the reason is because the human heart and mind we don't, do not make a distinction between mind and heart. Human heart and mind combines, combines, and also governs human nature on the one hand and human feelings. And human nature is the inner pattern of being human. So the human nature is the idea, is the principle, is the principle that governs us. It's the ultimate ground that we are human. But human feelings, they are, there are patterns in human feelings, because everything has patterns. There are patterns in human feelings. But human feelings as modalities of the vital energy can be understood as expressions, expressions 
of our nature. As expressions of our nature, they are also expressions of the heart and mind. But the difference is that some human feelings that truly express what the inner pattern of us being human beings is really, is really functioning. Some emotions stimulated by outside forces express themselves in such a way that our original capacity of the human mind to communicate, to establish sympathetic resonances, becomes compromised. So some feelings that are generative, transformative, some emotions that may turn out to be detrimental to the development of our true human nature. Now, you can, you can think in this way. Some feelings define who we are from the Confucian point of view as expressions of the inner pattern. Some emotions we have to tolerate because we are human beings. So we can say it is only human to be angry. It is only human to be joyful. It is only human to be jealous. It is only human sometimes to cherish some kind of grudge against others. It's all too human. human. Now, in, in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, there's only one word. That's qing, qing which actually means feelings or, or emotions. There's only one word. But in English, we have two words, feeling and emotion. So in order to help you to understand what I have in mind, I make a distinction between feelings and emotions. I use this, I know, in a very arbitrary way. Feelings are the four beginnings that define who we are. The feeling of commiseration, the feeling of deference, the feeling of right and wrong, the feeling of appropriateness. You've already encountered mentions. You, you, you know these four feelings, four emotions, four germs, four sprouts, four buts that help us to flourish as human beings. Humanity, rightness, wisdom, propriety came out of these feelings. So these are the four. But the seven emotions refer to our normal human feelings or emotions, anger, joy, sorrow, pleasure, these. The major debate in the 10 diagrams, and the, if you get a chance to read, especially the first one, between two great Korean Confucian thinkers. Uh, I don't want, it's no need for you to become totally familiar with the argument, but just to give a sense of the issues. The issues are vital for Confucian moral reasoning between Yi Tui Ge, who is the author of the Ten Diagrams, and one of his younger challengers by the name of Li Yu Gok. These are two positions. I don't know. I take one position, but some of you may take another position. That's fine. Most of my colleagues do not agree with me on this. Yi Tui Ge has this observation. Since the four beginnings as feelings define who we are, the more we have, the better we are as human beings. For example, the more commiseration you have, the more sense of right and wrong you have, the more sense of deference you have, the better human beings you will become. So these are the four. And he would say these four are expressions of our inner pattern. They are defining characteristics of being human. But the seven emotions are not necessarily so. They may be OK. Moral indignation is fine. But you become angry or angry all the time. It would be bad for social relationships, to be sure, but probably also extremely bad for your physical existence. There's a case of a prime minister in China who, in his diary, said he spent 19 years trying to control his anger. And yet, he still, be, he still turned out to be an angry old man. So the Confucians rec uh, commented on this. It's wrong. This is, the whole approach is wrong. 
we'll get a chance to say what is right, what is wrong in that sense. The to total approach is wrong. But anyway, there are emotions that as human beings we cannot but have. And yet these emotions, if they become excessive, they're not only detrimental to social relationships, they're also bad for us physically, the seven, emo seven emotions. So they need to be channeled. They need to be, uh, they need to be harmonized. Sometimes they need to be overcome. So the question for us in philosophy of psychology, which has very important ethical implications, should we make a qualitative difference between the four beginnings, the four feelings, and seven emotions, or not? Now, Yitui Ge would say, we have to make a qualitative difference. The four emotions, or the four feelings, are the feelings that we need to cultivate. And the seven emotions are the emotions we need to overcome to harmonize. So he used this thinking, he used this dichotomous thinking. The seven emotions are basically vital energies. And these vital energies, of course, they all have inner patterns. We, our conscious mind need to try to train ourselves to harmonize these vital, vital energies. And the, and the four, uh, four beginnings or the four feelings are important for us to cultivate. Now, his challenger, Leo Go, they say, no, 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 they are not qualitatively different. The four feelings are, in fact, more refined expressions of the seven emotions. If we cannot take advantage of the seven emotions. We, train, we transform our anger into certain kind of moral indignation. We transform our sense of sorrow to become concerned with the world. So these, are, these emotions are material that we need to use to transform. They are basis for the, seven feet, uh, for the four beginnings. So that's the major debate. One is to say you have to make a sharp distinction between the feeling of commiseration, which is sympathy, from the emotions. The other one is we have to transform our emotions so the emotions will help us to enhance our sense of ourselves in terms of commiseration, in terms of sympathy. But both of them believe that the cultivation of the mind is predicated on something else. The something else it's the state of the mind, I think I referred to earlier, the state of mind before the feelings are aroused, before the feelings come into being. This, of course, an assumption. An assumption is that, is it possible for a trained mind, a disciplined mind, to detect emotions and feelings before they manifest themselves? The term they use as a, is an incipient activation. Spring has not yet come, but you, have, you see the buds of trees as indications the coming of the spring. Feelings are also like that. Emotions are like that. There are deep reasons for some of the emotion, emotive states to emerge before they come into being. And there is a tendency. These tendencies could be considered as buts or as uh, beginnings. Now, if we can anticipate, if we train ourselves to be able to anticipate these feelings to express themselves, we'll be able to, not just to overcome them, we'll be able to channel them to the best use. Now, the reason that angry old man, that prime minister, was not able to deal with anger is because he dealt with his anger when he became angry. From the Confucian point of view, if you try to deal with your anger when you become angry, it is painfully difficult. The idea is like the dam that has burst and try to stop it, too late. Like to smash a mountain, you can never do it. Because what you ought to have done is to anticipate the forces, the conditions that will contribute to that angry state to become manifested. So that is the training of the heart and mind. This kind of training 
involves an anticipatory reading of the inner self. Important to know here, this is not, you know, because there are all kinds of activities going on around, uh, around here, it is not the acquisition of a psychological technology. It is not an acquisition, you know, training, some kind of uh, calming your heart, some kind of training. You want to be a, become a good athlete. You want to play tennis. You go through this kind of training, you become a better tennis player. You become a chess player, you become a good scientist. You learn the art of controlling your mind. This is a kind of acquisition, a certain kind of psychological technology. But this is not it. It is a way of living and a form of life. Now, Tui in his di diagrams, following Zhu Xi and others, recommend three methods. One method, which is the most mundane, which is most ordinary, but eventually probably the most effective. That is try to develop a certain kind of uh, mindfulness through propriety. In other words, ritual practice. You force upon yourself, this is voluntary. If it is imposed upon you from outside, it would never work. You force upon yourself certain daily rituals. The way you walk, the way you talk, the way you get up, certain rituals. And force yourself to submit yourself to these kind of rituals. And once these rituals become internalized, they will be able to help you to understand your heart and mind. But the second method, the method of concentration, the method of uh, single-mindedness, is what is considered. It's very, on the surface, very Buddhistic, but it is not. This is called constantly being alert. That training of constantly being alert is difficult to understand. I'll give you one uh, anecdote, and you will appreciate it. In the 60s, there a general survey of uh, different states of the mind in terms of uh, spiritual discipline in the Buddhist monks. For example, in Japan, they've done that. Some of the great Zen masters, they will be able to sit down for a very long period of time and constantly being alert. So they are wired so we could test their brain, brain waves. Normally, when they sit down, they will produce very broad alpha waves. You know, after a little bit of uh, beta waves, they, they will be able to do that. But when you, uh, you clap your hand or shout at him, there will be a sharp response, very sharp response. After the sharp response, they will gradually will be able to produce good alpha waves again. Even after 15 hours of sitting, this pattern remains. Now, in the ordinary situation, if you try to do that, we would, we would uh, gradually be able to produce this. When you have some kind of stimulus from the outside, it would be sharp and would take a, quite a while to become you do it. And then, in about an hour or so, the stimulation would be very little. And then, of course, it means you're half, half asleep. This is, this is what normally we do that. But in the constantly being alert, it's the ability to be awakened, totally sensitive, sympathetic, to all the forces from outside. Even the drop of a pain will be heard, and yet immediately return to that very calm state of mind. So this, this is the training that is much more focused. It's much better than simply the training of following some kind of rituals. All these are related to the particular training that is characterized, the training in ordinary days in the state of reverence. The state of reverence in the analects is to say, whenever you, you walk out, walk out of the house, you always psychologically tell yourself you're going to meet a major guest. A major guest is coming. Your uncle or your mentor, your friend is coming. So immediately, the state of mind becomes different if you're going to meet a major guest. Or the instruction for the governors or for people who are in uh, political responsibility is to say, whenever you want to use the people, the spirit of reverence, is that you use the people in the spirit of a major ceremony, like an ancestral ceremony. Once you walk into the temple, 
your mind is collected. Every move is considered ritualized. So this sense of living in an ordinary situation requires, therefore, the final, you know, the final diagram in the, uh, in the book to become sage is diligence, to get up early in the morning and continuously try to refine oneself in, in the sense of diligence. Now, once the mind is trained through either ritual practice, through the concentration of single-mindedness, through the spirit of reverence and diligence, then the mind will be a true receptor in terms of commu communication with the outside world. And that communication reveals a generative, a generative force. And also, we call it a concerned consciousness. I'll give you, uh, the time is short, I'll give you a, a very simple illustration of this problematic in terms of the gender question. This is my last point, but I think would tie all this together. Um, in the Harvard School of Education, a professor who developed moral reasoning, the most comprehensive moral reasoning, following Piaget, argues that moral reasoning is based upon our ability to reason, to make decisions. So rationality is the most important form of moral reasoning. There's a concrete example of the six-year-olds. The six-year-olds, the boys, six-year-olds, will always be able to make decisions very quickly, whereas the girls cannot make decisions very quickly. So this professor following Piaget concludes that boys at the age of six turn out to be morally more developed than girls. The concrete example used is this, a concrete example. A druggist, uh, I mean uh, a father who, uh, whose wife is sick, a uh, husband, wife, wife is sick, and decides, and he thinks he's very poor, and decides to steal some dr uh, drug from, uh, uh, from the pharmacy. So should he be punished? Now all the boys following rules and regulations to say, of course, he violated laws, so he should be punished. Many of the girls at the age of six will not be able to answer that question directly. They ask following questions. How nice would it be if the wife were not sick? And how nice it would be if the druggist was kind enough to give the drug freely? And how nice it would be if the husband was not poor? So these are not true conditions. Now the question we, we need to ask ourselves, which is morally superior? A person who is to make up his mind what is right and wrong based upon rules governed by the society, or a person, this time a girl, who cannot make up her mind because her sympathetic understanding of the situation and her ability to see connectedness of all these things and develop certain kind of concerned consciousness. So now in the, in the area of moral reasoning, for years and years, people just assumed the boys were more superior because they follow Piaget's idea of rationality. To be able to think rationally, to make up this decision, that's morally superior. But I think the Confucian argument, if you follow my argument concerning sympathetic understanding and so forth, the girl at age of six seems to be a better representation of this concern consciousness. The inability to make decision based upon certain kind of sympathetic understanding of the connectedness of the work may turn out to be eventually more efficacious in terms of moral reasoning.